Hi, good morning, uh, and welcome to Embracing Technology, Inspiring the Future. My name is Karina Kirsch. Uh, I'm a historian of art and digital media, and sometimes art critic and curator. So in today's short 45-minute panel, our guests will discuss their work as artists, curators, and art professionals within the nascent domain of non-fungible tokens, also known as NFTs, also known as NFTs. Um, NFTs are tokens that represent ownership of an asset, such as a work of art, and that asset generally is backed by the Ethereum blockchain. So NFTs are the latest art and technology sensation. With the flurry of media hype surrounding the millions in cryptocurrencies siphoned into online auctions of NFTs, our guests are here to illuminate what's going on in their own work and practice regarding NFTs. Why artists interested in them? Why do others find them? Loads some. So our guests have been involved with digital art under crypto for years and can provide some much needed perspective on the presentism in much of the discourse surrounding NFTs. They can help separate the myths of the gold rush from the cold reality, focused on culture, history, and a little bit of theory. So each panelist is going to have a few minutes to talk about their work within the crypto space or digital space generally, followed by questions for the group. Uh, and we'll take questions from the audience in the last 10 minutes or so. Cool. All right. So now on to brief introductions for our panelists, um, starting with Sarah. So Sarah. Mayohas is a conceptual artist with a background in photography and finance. In February 2015, Sarah released her own altcoin, Bitcoin. It was one of the first tokenizations of art on the blockchain, released several months prior to the Ethereum network going live. And this year, Sarah migrated Bitcoin off its native network to Ethereum and released newly minted Bitcoins in an online auction at Philips. And uh, Bitcoin realized a combined hammer price of over $395,000 in Ether. Welcome, Sarah. Um, and now to Kevin McCoy. Uh, this is just going to go by really quickly and then uh, individuals. So Kevin is an associate professor in art at New York University. Alongside his partner, Jennifer McCoy, they've been making work involving technical media and culture since the 1990s. In 2014, McCoy co-founded Monograph, a digital rights management technology for NFTs and other assets on the blockchain. That same year, he released Quantum, a work originally minted in 2014 on the Namecoin blockchain. The work has been reminted for preservation on the Ethereum network, where it is currently part of the Sotheby's natively digital NFT sale. Uh, great to have you here, Kevin. Um, Robert Norton. Um, Robert is the founder and chief executive officer of Verisart USA, formerly the CEO of digital art sales platforms, Sedition and Saatchi Online. Launched in 2015, Verisart allows individuals to create their own certificates of ownership for artwork on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, for arts and collectibles and recently NFTs. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Kalani Nicole. Kalani Nicole is the founder of Transfer Gallery, which began in Brooklyn in 2013. She works with artists who create work in and around digital culture in formats such as GIFs, algorithms, and VR. Like several of our panelists, Kalani has been around the block, so to speak, and has been privy to shifts in digital art practice from discussions about how to create dialogue, exhibit, and sell online and distributed artworks. Transfer currently has an exhibition of NFTs with a current exhibition called Pieces of Me, held in partnership with Left Gallery. Kalani, always a pleasure. And last but not least, Mark Saab. Mark Saab is an artist and technology advisor, uh, currently the creative director at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, while also a founder at Felt Scene a creative studio and internet art collective dedicated to the intersection of arts, activism, community, and culture. Mark was previously the senior director of innovation at the Museum of the African Diaspora and established the museum's digital presence along with pioneering on-site implementations of augmented and virtual reality. Mark, thank you for being here so early in the morning. 
So let's get the conversation uh, started with you. Um, what's your role with uh, NFTs? How are you involved? How is Feltzine involved? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, um, we create a lot of NFTs, um, <laughs> very, very high volume of NFTs. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I just being, we, we were, we, we got started in 2011. Um, okay. so, you know, of course, we've been really deeply involved with digital art, um, before NFTs. And, um, you know, I think in a, in a lot of ways, just, you know, seeing things like, people like like what Kalani was doing with transfer was I think like really inspiring to us and, and just seeing I think other people who were who were pushing what was happening, especially in digital art and internet art in a lot of ways. Um, we're we're always excited ab- about what's happening in the space, right? And I think as as things change and as things happen, um, we're we're pretty quick to like experiment with things. So um, we did our first, I guess like major NFT show after dabbling in NFTs. I think like November of 2020. Um, so it was mm-hmm. kind of like, like right before I think the, um, the, the bigger, you know, sort of like bigger push happened um, probably around like late February or March. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, we're fans of the space, but you know, not never uh, dogmatic about anything. So I think, you know, like a, a, a healthy sort of, uh, you know, understanding of, of what's going on, but um, do everything from create, uh, you know, my own art, which I then meant as NFTs to um, helping other artists uh, pr- uh, get NFTs up as well. And um, yeah, just sort of playing our role in that way. I think all of this is, of course, still being determined and, and created in real time. Uh, I also have an, an NFT uh, that's a part of Kalani's Pieces of Me uh, exhibition. Right. So I was really excited about that. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think a lot of our fan base and I think people who are like very deep in the net art world are really excited to see Transfer and Feldzine come together. So so that was really awesome, I think. And like um, seeing like really, I think, healthy, anticipated collaborations come to fruition is really cool. And um, yeah, even in my work now at, at the European Center for the Arts, you know, we're, we're discussing ways that we could bring NFTs to the to the table there or, or you know, work with different types of, you know, uh, like what like crypto technology, whether, you know, whatever that means, DAOs, et cetera. I think that there are people who do like a lot of really critical work, um, especially people who I think are, are sort of in Kalani circle, people like, um, like Wade and, and, um, doctor, I think her name is Dr. Tina Rivers. I know I mostly see these mm-hmm. people um, on, on Twitter, honestly, but, um, it's really cool because I think they're sort of more critical work has also um, helped me to question the function of like what what we're actually using, right? And and help to think beyond, um, I think, just the NFT. So, uh, you know, just really happy to sort of like be in the space and like hear from multiple different voices that are, that are excited about different things. That's really great and actually so rare to hear that there is a an ability for a critical dialogue to actually like, promote and make a more robust world for the practitioners. Um, and real quick, um, when you say high volume NFTs for the audience, what what is a high volume of, like, what's a number? <laughs> oh, God, Ten? honestly, I mean, probably like, probably, I mean, seriously, probably like sometimes like two or three a week. Uh, okay. But but that's also the nature of like the fact that, um you know, we are on like a lot of different marketplaces. I think the fact that I've mm-hmm. been involved with digital art a long time, um, you know, a lot of people who are making, especially like the newer marketplaces were, are inspired by a lot of the art that we've been doing for a long time. Or they're, they're, they're people who like went to a lot of our events, um, you know, especially over like the last 10 years when, when we've been doing stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, we're really, I think, like pretty in- deeply involved in the space in that way. Um, and then there's also uh, NFTs that we meant that are that are not on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and so stuff that's on like the, the Tezos blockchain are like very, very cheap to mint, like, like, you know, like 10 cents to make like an addition of 10 or something like that. Right. Mm. So um, and that's what I mean. And we experiment with, with things a lot. Right. So um, I think that like 
So, yeah, just to answer that quickly, I don't want to take up all the time because I don't really have a limited time, but um, probably like two to three um, NFTs a week at, at probably any time. Sometimes less than that, but probably max three. Thanks. Um, and that's a perfect segue for Kalani. Um, tell us about uh, pieces of me and also your background uh, in this space, because um, obviously you've worked with artists over the years who have experimented in many different ways with uh, the crypto space. Yeah, uh, I'm fortunate to work with some very prescient folks. And actually, back in 2013, the gallery, uh, Transfer Gallery, did a solo show with an artist called Le Turbo Avidon, and they're an avatar, and they exist online. So they were really excited about this new kind of currency. So we actually priced and sold work in Bitcoin way back then. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, my role professionally, I work in technology in addition to running the gallery. So I've had clients in the space of the decentralized web and have sort of been thinking about these issues for a very long time. Um, and as NFTs came up, um, yeah, it was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, and for someone who deeply respects the history of time-based media art that came well before me, even, uh, it was kind of hard to see this sort of just hitting and all of that history sort of being rewritten um, or overwritten, right, or overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, so Pieces of Me came out as, um, first of all, something that wasn't about money in a space where everything else is. It was about bringing together different perspectives, uh, trying to initiate a space for dialogue. Mark, it means so much to me to hear that, you know, your participation in the show and the prompt about, you know, how do you want to transact with intention in this new world? What does that mean to you? That that sort of, you know, brought new thinking into, into your mind in this space. Um, so yeah, pieces of me, I'm just going to drop a line, a uh, link in the chat. It's for now an online exhibition. We're looking at evolving it into a physical show later this year. Um, but it brings together 50 artists. Um, and part of the purpose of the show was to, yeah, also address the polarizing dialogue in this space. We saw that as NFTs really came to light, people either loved NFTs and were so excited about it, super positive, what we called toxic positivity, because if you had anything negative to say you were fud right you were you were you're just trying to create fear uncertainty and doubt and you know you weren't on the train and i knew that there was much more to the conversation than that from being in the space for a long time so pieces of me brings together artists who um fully embrace nfts and maybe have really only seen a market in this new marketplace with artists who completely reject them and it makes space for everyone to talk about time-based media art and where we're kind of at in this moment of evolution I'm gonna stop. Thanks, Kalani. Robert, tell us a bit about uh, Verisart, your background, and also uh, becoming involved with NFTs. Uh, yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I've been in the intersection of art and tech for about 12 years. I was the um, uh, person responsible for um, moving Saatchi uh, online uh, from a kind of individual collection of assets of Charles Saatchi to a standalone entity, uh, VC backed, which we then uh, sold to Leaf Group in um, uh, Santa Monica. Um, and my time then, I guess, kind of made me think about how we could do a better job in building a platform for artists that primarily didn't have gallery representation. Uh, in terms of helping them sell works direct to consumer. Um, and it's kind of like an Etsy for artists online and, and one of the biggest sites for selling direct from artists to consumers uh, on the web. Um, and then after Sarchi Online, I met uh, Harry Blaine, who had this idea for uh, digital editions. Uh, this was back in 2010. Um, and it was a kind of challenging idea because he was inspired somewhat more by the ringtone market at the time where people had been kind of getting like custom ringtones on their phone, uh, you know, in the sort of like mid 2000 to sort of like 2006, 2007, 2008, with a kind of like heyday of that, of that sort of uh, market. And um, we set about building Sedition Art, uh, which is uh, uh, still um, running and um, has an incredible um, um, collection of artists that have um, sold works as digital editions um, pre crypto. Um, so, you know, Sedition started in 2010 um, and was very successful in um, appealing to many of the world's leading contemporary artists. So when I was at Sarch Online, it was about kind of growing the number 
of artists that could actually make a living from selling their work. And at Sedition, it was really about, can you grow the number of collectors? Can you sort of bring more people into the art world in a kind of uh, cheaper cost point? So you could buy a Damien Hirst for $5 and get a JPEG of his spot painting. Um, but many of the things that we had to think about at Sedition uh, was how do you, um, uh, you know, create value when obviously a digital asset can be reproduced uh, infinitely and there's no difference between the original and the kind of copy. So we started, we, we created a certification in-house uh, at Sedition um, and we kind of like thought about the certificate as the effectively the unique title that would allow you to call um, the version of the object that was right for your screen size or for your uh, broadband or, or narrowband connection, whatever that may be. Um, and we didn't do too well uh, in terms of building a consumer market uh, with the three years that I was there. I left in 2013, slightly disappointed that we did a, you know, we built a good site, we had great artists, uh, it worked. Um, you know, our, our CTO then went on to kind of run and uh, develop relations at Unity, Silvio drew in, and, and it just wasn't really, it wasn't really working. And, and I think at that time, uh, I think we were early. Um, I think mm-hmm. that there was still the sense that uh, if I see something online, it should be free. Like, why do I need mm-hmm. to buy a digital uh, artwork? Um, and, you know, in the kind of contemporary art market, the um, evidence was actually if you wanted to build value, you would ring fence the digital object in some kind of like physical sculpture or physical piece of hardware, you know, famously like Bill Viola, who Harry represented as an artist, you know, would sell his works in sp- with specific hardware. And he is, as an artist, really interesting because he'd gone through so many different phases in his career where he started selling them as DVDs or pre-DVDs, VHS cassettes, and then CD-ROMs and kind of like settled on, well, actually, so in order to build a value, you need to have the physical hardware. Um, anyway, just to kind of um, cut through to, to, to Verisart and, and specifically what we've been doing in the NFT space, we started Verisart back in 2015 largely focused on um, dealing with the issues of providing better certification standards for physical artworks. Uh, I wasn't too interested in the digital art market, having that experience of sedition, um, but we felt that in the physical art market, there are real problems in terms of fakes, unauthorized reproductions, and you know, moving beyond paper-based certificates to digital certification. We now have over 10,000 artists that are on Verisart using it for their certification purposes, and we've registered about 45,000 certificates to date. So uh, it is working. It takes some time, but we're getting there. What happened in the last six to uh, 12 months is that my perspective on um, digital art not being a reliable consumer market and a commercial proposition obviously completely changed. Um, and there were a couple of things that really uh, um, sort of were, were, were kind of key points that made that change. The first was I was on the panel with Devin Finzer from OpenSea, and it forced me to read the NFT Bible and sort of look again. This was last September, October, about the space. We also published a Medium post on, on Verisart saying that NFT is the future of the art market last December. Um, and by doing that, we kind of spoke to artists and collectors and the different CEOs of the different market bases and really got a sense that this was actually a really broad, emerging, very interesting kind of market. And then obviously, you know, from December to where we are now in six months, the whole world has changed. And it's sort of, we've seen this rise of NFTs and somewhat decline of NFTs in a short space of time. But at Verisart, what we did is we decided to get involved and to launch 10 Genesis NFTs from artists like Shepard Ferry, Random International, Patrick Courtright, A.S. Neff, and, and others. And now we're following up with uh, Genesis NFTs from eight artists that are specifically working within code um, uh, as their primary means, whether it's Keola, John Mader, Recycle Group, Jake Elwes, Matteo Zamani, and others. And what we've really seen is that, you know, th- 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 there's a huge demand out there for, um, you know, people to collect digital assets. Um, and I think the crypto uh, and the use, well, primarily the use of Ethereum, but particularly the ERC-721 smart contract, you know, has really given people confidence that they can retain value uh, in what they're buying and that there's a big marketplace for it. So, you know, we see, we see it as very early on, um, but that's been kind of my, my background into to where we got to today. Thanks. Kevin. 
Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, great comments from everybody so far. It's so interesting to hear, uh, you know, the, the, these these stories and, and where people are, are coming from. Um, and so my comments are a bit kind of looking backwards, but also trying to look uh, forwards. Um, so I'm a longtime uh, digital artist, media artist working in uh, this world of disembodied uh, uh, art making and art objects um, for a long time and um, working collaboratively, working in the art world in the context of galleries, uh, you know, my gallery here in New York that I work with Postmasters. Uh, and so um, suffering the, uh, you know, through the promises and the limitations uh, of the uh, kind of world of media art as it intersects with, um, with the traditional art world, um, you know, in, in, in both kind of good and bad. Um, in 2012, uh, encountered Bitcoin for the first time and uh, kind of fell in love uh, with the kind of philosophy and the technology and the promise behind it and this mysterious uh, alchemy that uh, Satoshi created between ubiquity and scarcity within the digital realm uh, that is so uh, today still so kind of incredible. Uh, and then in, in 2013, um, began participating in, uh, you know, where the crypto community was uh, congregating back in those days, which was the Bitcoin Talk Forum, uh, and uh, began writing and, and, and discussing around how this technology could be of use to digital artists, to artists that were making disembodied media. Um, uh, you know, agreement with several uh, points raised so far, uh, up until this moment of, of, of art on the blockchain, um, digital artists would resort to um, physicalizing their works in different ways to create art objects uh, that could uh, participate in an art market or in, in, a, in, a, in a gallery context. Um, and, and, and I did that, and, and that, you know, can be quite interesting artistically, um, but, there, you know, there's always this sense of, like, it's not really the real thing. Uh, and so looking, you know, from what was happening with the net art movement and mm -hmm. artists working with the Internet um, in the 90s and into the, you know, into the, um, the early 2000s, um, you know, there was this uh, beautiful exuberance, um, but no, uh, but no market, no market participation. Um, and so I saw in, in, in blockchain technology a possibility to um change that equation in some ways. Uh, and then so in 2014, uh, at the invitation of uh, digital art organization Rhizome uh, and at the new museum here in New York, uh, I presented a first uh, example of how blockchain technology could be used to create um, both provenance and ownership, uh, specifically around digital artworks. Uh, and in the context of that uh, public presentation, created three um, NFTs. Of course, that term didn't exist back then. Uh, we you know, called it something else something better i think but oh well and uh we uh um uh, and, and then at the, but simultaneously to that um create started creating public tools that people could use um, on their own artists could use to um you know to kind of follow along and do this as well too um and so now that that those those works are now kind of seen as kind of the first nfts they set um uh for better or worse, uh, formal approaches that are still widely used uh, in NFTs today. By that, I mean uh, uh, the NFT is a kind of metadata um, uh, uh, construction that references um, information that's stored off chain with various kinds of proof um, conditions that are attached to it. That's still the main um, format, uh, uh, you know, that that, uh, that that people are using. Um, and so, uh, you know, then, you know, the other kind of point of history just to kind of bring up is then in 2015 and in 2016, in kind of a startup mode, uh, you know, me and my partners developed the first marketplaces for NFTs. And we had a you know, very robust uh, software ecosystem that let people register works. We're using the Bitcoin blockchain, um, sell them, uh, view them in a kind of collections environment mobile app, all this kind of stuff, um, very much like what the uh, marketplaces are today, Foundation, Nifty Gateway, things like that. Uh, the difference being there was absolutely zero market. And so, uh, you know, complete absence of people wanting to buy things. And so by that, I mean, you know, we would sell one thing a month for 40 bucks, something like that. And so it's, <laughs> it was painful uh, and ultimately futile. Um, and so uh, it was, it's remarkable to see how, um, you know, the importance of timing and the importance of, of a kind of, um, I don't know, global awareness, you know, that somehow magically crystallizes versus the absence of that awareness. And in the absence of that awareness, there's nothing you can do. And so the, 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 the you know, kind of current wave of NFTs that we're all 
here and kind of participating in and talking about is credit to the Ethereum community and the uh, efforts they did around standardization and interoperability and just kind of general community um, development. Uh, and so the major players that have kind of laid the groundwork for the current wave of which, you know, they're open D and um, you know, uh, uh, known origin, even uh, super rare, those sorts of things, the ERC-721 standard through CryptoKitties, uh, all that stuff is, um, you know, is, 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 the, is, the, is the current base that we're all uh, now kind of operating on. Um, and so that, you know, and that history kind of starts in kind of 2018-ish kind of thing. So it's got a long history. Um, and then just, you know, I want to say a couple of things about looking forward. Um, the, you know, I think that we're going to see more and more um, works of um, where, where the blockchain is considered as a kind as part of the generative environment of the works, and so more kind of sophisticated on-chain um, use of smart contracts. Um, I think that we're on the very cusp of seeing NFTs as a basis for community definition and community engagement, um, and I think that that's going to happen in a number of different ways. Um, and I think that we're going to see uh, as more and more assets become tokenized, we're going to see the importance of a rights model and rights um, in that traditional sense in the traditional legal sense um, being brought on chain uh, because there's such a vast amount of um, of assets that might be digital but their rights encumbered and so that rights model has to be um, brought into uh, brought into the equation and that was something that fell away along the wayside um, in the kind of current you know ethereum version of it that was present um, uh, at least in the platform that um, that uh, that I developed so that idea of generative work and um, and, and community-based tokens and uh, rights models, I think it's going to be the direction that the future is going to going to point to. Thank you, Kevin. So interesting. Um, Sarah, last but not least, tell us about your work. Yeah. Um, so I um, so in 2014, I I heard about Bitcoin and uh, thought it was. And at the time, I was in grad school in art school, and I had come out of studying finance before that. So I was very interested in our conceptions of value generally, how value relates to representation, how value relates to beauty, how exchange impacts, you know, what is valued. Uh, and um, I did a project at the time that took essentially trends I was seeing, which was the financialization of art, um, blockchain uh, as and like decentralization as a new kind of nascent uh, you know movement and also people turning themselves into brands mm -hmm. this was really like the beginning of kind of like the explosion of social media uh, and I took these trends and I like took them to an extreme as an artwork and that's how I came up with Bitcoin uh, which was you know obviously meant to be funny and I made an altcoin with the help of someone I found on the internet. Uh, and we turned this gallery, which was a shipping container unit in Brooklyn, into a mine, mining bitcoins. And then I set up a system where essentially I had taken a photograph that I called a speculation, another play on words um, with specular relations with mirrors. And I backed it at a fixed rate um, so that, you know, each Bitcoin that I sold was backed by 25 square inches of my print, um, which I put in a bank safety deposit box as if the photograph was gold. And um, so at the time, it got like it got a whole bunch of kind of popular press and um, including Karina who wrote an article about it at the time. And uh, and and at the time, I was like I was just a grad student. So I realized I had sort of hit on something like I had like put my finger on some sort of pulse and people were excited about like these ideas and but there was no real way for me to continue and do something further along with it um I myself like I'm not scared of working in technical with technical people in technical projects but I myself and I'm not like a developer so I you know it kind of just stayed as that project and I went on to do other projects. Um, but the, the one fun thing that did come of it was that uh, I did partly because, you know, Bitcoin had sort of struck a nerve with people. I did invest in OpenSea in the seed round uh, in 2018, which was like, uh, like a 
happy accident as well. <laughs> Cause for like two years I was like, well, maybe OpenSea wasn't a great investment. And then suddenly it was a great investment. <laughs> uh, so, um, and, uh, and now when the NFT sort of craze started again, I thought like, well, what should I, I really want to make sure, you know, people in the art world remember Bitcoin. Um, but I really want to make sure that when, you know, the cultural history of crypto and art is written, Bitcoin is like mentioned, is like a part of it. And um, so, and I thought about how to do it. And like, there is a deluge to a certain extent, NFTs now, the interesting thing is people talk about how they, you know, it's scarce. It's like a non-fungible token, but actually we are living in an environment of non-scarcity. Uh, the mm -hmm. availability of like, digital images now is is like feels more than ever um and so i was really thinking about how you know how to bring back bitcoin in a way that felt like authentic and real and also was like kind of providing that like real value um and i wanted to make sure that it remained like a financial piece you know uh as it as it was at the beginning and so i backed it out of i backed it again physically and this is kind of where i think nfts could could go um so I backed it by these physical press pedals that are essentially the proof of work of a larger project I did called Cloud of Pedals. And each pedal, one worker had picked out 30, you know, picked apart a, a rose into 30 pedals and chosen one per rose that was most beautiful. And then from the data set of 100,000 rose petals that they photographed, I used AI to generate new images of rose petals. It was a whole piece about um, automation and AI and like where does subjectivity and beauty and the human fit within those trends? Uh, and the petals are kind of the, the materially scarce relic of that performance. Um, and so I backed each new Bitcoin uh, by its corresponding petal. And what I'm saying, and we auctioned some of them off, I sold some of them, but what it's essentially proposing is that there can be stewardship of a physical artwork that is separate from like how its financial you know value can be traded um and i do think like in a sense you know the, the promise of nfts have been that like what is otherwise freely available information can suddenly accumulate some sort of financial value both to the creator and also to like whoever is buying and selling it and that's been you know a financial innovation to me NFTs are not yet ownership. They're like a proof of fandom. They're like a cousin of ownership. Um, and they give you like most things that ownership does give you, except for the hassle of actually like being a steward of the thing. Like I am the one, right, that's responsible for making sure I pay like my pinata so that the hash of my videos like stays forever. And I am responsible like for the pedals, <laughs> like keeping them and make sure nothing happens to it. So separating... Um, separating those things has been amazing for, you know, digital art, like photography, a cousin of digital art, since it also can be like reproduced infinitely. But it could also be a really interesting um, innovation for for physical art that is also like difficult for people to own. Um, and uh, that's where I think things could get interesting. I also totally agree with Kevin. My next piece is like actually a smart contract uh, that like, so I do think that there's going to be like more innovation in, um, in that way. And I also think that social tokens will, will become more of a, of a thing. And Bitcoin kind of like touches on, on social tokens. Um, but anyways, we should just chit chat. I don't know. We should, we should all chit chat. Um, and uh, thank you for what I'm going to call an amuse bouche, this little taste of everyone's work. Um, right now I'm full of questions. And if I were very selfish, I would just talk to you, each of you guys for hours. Um, so at this point, um, I just want to remind any audience members, if they have questions, um, please feel free to write them in the comments section. Um, or uh, I guess there's this uh, mic feature. Um, but um, up until then, um, I... I'm really interested in um, a couple of things here. So one, just this entire system of different actors who are involved in NFTs. So we have the artist perspective, we have the um, 
perhaps the auction or platform perspective. And then we have these different buyers or communities. Um, and another thing that's coming up for me is just this idea of uh, it's the long history, the long arcs of um, digital art practice, thinking about uh, 90, the 90s with net art. I'm thinking of how information is free. Um, uh, was perhaps like the motto of the age. And then with the 2000s, we still have a lot of like post-internet art where we have work that maybe uh, references the digital but is uh, packaged in a physical object. And then now now it's this interesting hybrid blend um, or mess um, that we're trying to figure out. But I do, I am interested in these shifts. Um, so I'll just open this up to the room, whomever mm -hmm. wants to say anything, fight over I, talking until we get any questions from the audience. I would just say, you know, pick up on one thing that you just said, you know, the um, about the, this kind of information wants to be free, you know, and the you know, the idea in this original idea of blockchain based ownership that I presented was presented in public and it had a very public uh, birth, uh, uh, you know, in, in, you know, through, through the new medium. Um, and uh, that was very much in the age of creative commons um, and, and, mm -hmm. and information wants to be free uh, kind of ethos. And I think rightly it was seen as a big, uh, you know, movement against that, you know, and it was this idea of owning information rather than information wants to be free. Um, and I think that that's accurate. You know, I think that that's true. Um, and I think that the, the, the you know, the idea of, 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 of ownership on that, um, in, in that sense, um, is, is, um, works against that, uh, ethos. Um, but I would say in defense of that, it provides options, right? That where previously options didn't exist before. And the downside that the information wants to be free, uh, you know, it's, you know, was also kind of well understood at that time, a kind of like, um, exploitative platformism where the value of that information was kind of aggregated by platforms, um, that were kind of taking advantage of information wants to be free. I mean, we see that with Flickr, the Flickr data set being the basis for so much of the AI, uh, face research, uh, work just for one, you know, kind of just to pick one example. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was, you know, kind of by running the risk of this sort of reactionary idea of, of, of ownership of information, um, you know, I, I do think that that uh, does provide important options, um, you know, that we're, that we're still engaging with today. Yeah, the other thing about it is, you know, it's not free. And I think that what Sarah was pointing to and what she said about stewardship and the, and, you know, the pain of stewardship and the, the maintenance of these works, like one issue I have that sort of just breaks my heart about the emergence of NFTs is it's really flattened digital art to be this one singular asset that points to in this one location. And those of us who are caretakers and stewards and creators of this kind of time-based media art know that it's much deeper and more complex than that. You know, these works need to be preserved. They need to be stored. They need to be maintained. They need to be migrated. They need to be updated. And the value in them will be doing that through time, right? And so the way that this market removes all of those frictions, I see as really problematic. Yeah, it makes it like trading cards, you know, like, yeah, which... Anyway. Yeah, I think uh, I want to add a couple of things onto that. I 100% agree with, with everything that's been said from Kevin, Sarah, and, and Kalani with regards to you know the fact that it's not been thought through the time-based preservation aspects of this. And in many cases, you know, there are you know real problems with the way IPFS works in the term in the sense that if <clears throat> uh, the server that uh, IPFS points to is no longer around, there's no guarantee that somebody else is going to be. Uh, hosting that asset for you and ultimately therefore you may not be able to see the work for which the smart contract refers to um, so I think time-based preservation is something that you know largely because we've seen this great rush driven by uh, really um, you know sky-high crypto prices and the excitement of kind of like just moving crypto around uh, with you know art as a reference to the uh, movement of those funds uh, there hasn't really been a lot of that 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 thinking um, at the same time, I also think there's been a lot of thinking with regards to what it means to be the collector. Because if to be the collector is just to know that I have the uh, underlying title right, or I have the unique sort of title, and I have the ability to trade it, then the only value for me being the collector is that I can potentially 
you know, have some social bragging, right? Right, in terms of like people may know if I identify myself as I'm the collector. There's no aesthetic value, right, in terms of me being the collector because the viewer experience, the collector experience, for the large part, the majority of kind of still based. Uh, images or video type NFTs is the same. So the real value in me being the trader, me being able to sell it to the next person for hopefully more than I pay for it, because I don't think people want to sell for less than they pay for it on the whole. And therefore, it really has, to Sarah's point, you know, the trading card analogy, it really has pigeonholed art as a transaction first medium. And we all know, I believe, everybody on this panel, that art is so much more than a transaction. It's a connection. It's a dialogue. And many other things. And so, one of the things that I think we'll see, you know, partly to um, Kevin's point about sort of seeing more generative kind of like works evolve, is that I think the collector experience is going to have to evolve because as you kind of move out of this like first wave of really crypto collectors, primarily kind of people that are already on crypto that are, you know, powering this kind of market, potentially having the excess funds from, you know, being early in on crypto or crypto kind of businesses. The next wave, there's going to need to be a meaningful relationship as owning it as the digital collector. Um, and so I would expect to see like more innovation there, whether it's, you know, allowing kind of like naming rights or, you know, some sort of data variable elements like what Async Heart are doing. But I think we are going to see um, certainly the collector experience being thought of a little bit more than it has been in the last 12, uh, you know, in, in this recent kind of like wave. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Mark, go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think I think the big thing for me is like, I think the underlying, you know, the underlying marketplaces or, or what or what they are trying to do, I think, in the in the bigger sense of what's happening, um, I think is good and, and has been helpful for a lot of creatives, like sort of as we mentioned that that necessarily like didn't see a marketplace for themselves, right? But I, I think that the the problem also comes in and just like the marketing and the hype that a lot of these marketplaces um and honestly just like crypto like bowls just make to, to to try to I think like you know just get like whatever get get eat to the moon right and and I think that like that's where a lot of the um you know in my opinion like a, a lot of the the negativity comes in is when you start acting like these things are something that that they're not so um it, it, it's not a solution um to the to the world's problems by any means and 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 I don't think that it necessarily is um the quote unquote solution to like democratizing like like art or or even the the art market right i mean um you and and i say it's like even as someone who who has done okay in the space like um you know i had like 10 years of essentially building a community before that right and and i think that there's this idea that um anybody who's an artist or anybody who's a collector can just come into the space um and, and find some success and, and that's just like that's just really not not the case right and people end up um actually losing a lot of money like doing these things and depending on when you entered into the space um you know as, as we stand right now uh, of course this could change tomorrow but like you you could have lost a lot of money in just ethereum itself um if, if you really like started like you know like a, a month or two ago right so i, I just think that like there, there's just some and the, and those are not things that like the bulls or the marketplaces are going to be honest about because um, it doesn't help their growth and it doesn't help what they need to do. Right. So I think that there just also needs to be like a separation from like the hype and and the technology, which which is just unfortunate because all this just runs off like social media algorithms. And whoever is essentially like the biggest ape is going to be like the loudest voice. And, and then that's what people are running with. Right. So I think that that that's just like a side. And then the last thing I just want to say, too, is like I think that there's a lot of. um excitement around the ways that that uh, especially a lot of recent nft sales um have supported um like philanthropic causes and i i think that that's really cool like there's there's things like um like people pleaser like you know releasing things for like pleasure dow or um, an artist named like nine shells who did something for tour project and um, I think that that's really like interesting. I think that that's awesome if people want to do that. But I just do want to say um, that I, I think that people um, just also should think about the fact that um, a lot of times these are artists who are, are of color and they're also women and they're getting their highest sales of art 
um, off of essentially what are like donations. And I think that there's just so much hype around it that people are not really going back and looking and realizing that their other pieces are not selling for that much. And I think we, I think just sort of, um, as we were saying, like, I think especially as, as Robert was, was saying, like, what are we supporting? Are we supporting like the art or the artist? Are we actually supporting like tour or, or Uniswap, which is okay too. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I think we should really think about like the value of, of art too. I really, I really appreciate you bringing up that point, Mark. And the other, the other thing in regards to those sales is like, why has philanthropic donation now become about bragging rights? Like, you could just give that money to Tor if you cared about the cause, and you could buy the work from Nine Shells. Like, you could do both, right? So I just got the notification that our time is over, which is crazy. Um, but.